Alright, if you take your Bibles tonight, and let's turn to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. We know that we are in a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle really that's getting uh, increasingly difficult as we approach the Lord's coming. But though we're not without help, uh, the Word of God tells us what we're to do. But the problem is, many times that we don't pay attention to what the Lord has to say. And when we fail to do what the Lord has to say, what happens is that we, we suffer for it. Here in Ephesians 6, verse number 10, and we're going to be dealing with verse number 18, uh, but I want, to, uh, I want to read these previous verses. Uh, in the context here because that is the context of verse 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I wonder, you know, could, could the reason why we see so many believers falling by the wayside, including men of God, uh, is it because the whole armor of God is not applied like it ought to be applied? Verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking a shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. This is our verse here praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and, supp and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We live in a world where way too many people lack discipline in their lives. The Bible word for that is incontinent. Now, we kind of giggle when we hear that word incontinent because we know that the way it's used today, we hear it a lot, uh, if you watch commercials, you hear people hawking products. It has to do with uh, folks who've lost control of some of their bodily functions. It's, you know, call them in, you know, incontinence products. Uh, uh, products and uh, talk about incontinence. Well, that's not what Paul was talking about. Okay, um, when he gave Timothy the various characteristics that would manifest themselves in the lives of people in the last days, that word incontinent uh, is one of those characteristics on that list. And what Paul was saying was that people would lack self-control. They lack self-control. They lack uh, self-control or they're unbridled, you might say, when it comes to the manner of living. They would lack the discipline in their lives, so much so that self-control is missing. And we began to look at uh, this before we left out of town on vacation, and uh, we began to look at some godly disciplines that need to be in our lives as believers, and by the way, it's not so much self-control that we're talking about when it comes to believers, it's spirit control. We need to be Holy Spirit controlled. Um, and that's evident from what the fruit of the Spirit is. But the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, fruit of the Spirit, you know, we're in verse 23, it called it, one of the ones that it uses is temperance. And temperance is Self-control is what it is. Uh, it's moderation, self-control. If we have an undisciplined lifestyle, uh, or 
undisciplined life, we're, we're headed for heartache. Those around us are headed for that also because when an undisciplined life is sown, it usually reaps um, a family full of undisciplined living. God's laws of sowing and reaping still come into play. And so discipline is something that we must learn to embrace and thank God for as we live for Him. Thank God that He doesn't allow us as believers to live our lives undisciplined without bringing some discipline to our lives. Chastening is what I'm talking about. We understand that when we fail to discipline ourselves and our loving Heavenly Father chastens, chastens us or disciplines our, our lives. And He does this because He loves His children too much to leave them in an undisciplined lifestyle. Now, as I was growing up as a kid, our parents, my parents, uh, they knew the necessity of discipline. Both of them. And we, so Mama's favorite was using the switch. Daddy's favorite was using the belt. There were times when we got would get undisciplined in our life, and Mom and Daddy would be careful to bring discipline back to our lives uh, because they loved us too much to see us grow up uh, with undisciplined lifestyles because of, of where it would lead us. And I, I'm so glad now, wasn't glad then, you know, uh, but, uh, but I'm glad now that they did that uh, so that I didn't uh, live a, a life that uh, took me in the wrong direction. The Apostle Paul we saw had linked the idea of discipline with the spiritual life and 1 Timothy 4, 7, where he said, Exercise thyself rather for godliness. And we were talking about that, and that in the physical realm, we, we know that exercise is discipline that tones our bodies, right? It's, it's, a, it's a physical discipline that we do. And in the spiritual realm, we find things are much the same way. When we're exercising our, our spiritual life for godliness, is a spiritual workout or spiritual routines that tone our spiritual life. These things that we're talking about are intended to help you develop a toned uh, life as a believer, a life that's pleasing to the Lord. It helps us to develop godliness. And, uh, of course, godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come, Paul went on to tell Timothy that. And so we should be doing all that we can to make sure that we're exercising ourselves to godliness, doing the things that develop godliness in our lives. And our lives as believers are, are to be about bringing our wills, our will, and every area of our lives under submission to God's will. And that's what godly discipline is. If you remember last time, we, we began by looking at just a couple of, of disciplines that ought to be in, in each of our lives. And we said, you know, it all begins with salvation. Not the gospel. You've got to have the, the discipline of the gospel. If you're not saved, you're not born again, then you have zero chance of a truly disciplined lifestyle. Zero chance. One cannot live a godly life without the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the way to get the indwelling Holy Spirit is to be born again. Amen. We need the discipline of submission, we said. Uh, willingly bringing our lives into submission to God's will and everything is key to being a godly person. Finding and doing the will of God is the key to having joy and living the abundant life in Christ. Now let's take a look uh, at another discipline that is needed in our lives as believers, and that is this discipline of prayer. That's what we want to deal with tonight. We need the discipline of prayer. Quite simply speaking, prayer is talking with God. Uh, I like to use this example. I heard it many years ago, but there was a fellow that was asked to pray in church, and uh, he prayed uh, as a prayer, and after the service, some fellow walked up to him and took him to task over what he prayed and said, I didn't like what you said in your prayer. <laughs> he said, well, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> and that's true. You know, when, when we're talking to God, we're not talking to anybody else. We're not supposed to be. I know there are some folks when they pray, they, uh, they sound like they're praying not to be heard of God, but be praying to be heard of men. And we need to be careful about that. 
uh, guard against that because we are talking to God and we need to have God in mind and uh, understand that we are talking with, to Him. Prayer is our line of communication with God. And one cannot live a godly life apart from having an active prayer life. Now, according to our text here in Ephesians 6.18, one way that we have to battle in the spiritual warfare that we find ourselves in is to pray. Pray always with all supplicate, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, in other letters that Paul wrote to churches, he addressed this matter of prayer. Um, when he wrote to the Colossians, he said in Colossians 4, verse 2, continue in prayer, listen, continue in prayer, and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Now, we'll come back to that here in just a minute. Philippians 4, 6, when he wrote to the Philippian church, he said, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, again, with thanksgiving. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Romans 12, 1, rejoicing, uh, excuse me, Romans 12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. In other words, we ought to be able to Pray in an instant. If you need to pray, you ought to be able to have a you ought to have a, the ability to to breathe a prayer out when you need to breathe one out <clears throat> at just a moment's notice. And uh, that's I think that's the meaning by, behind what he wrote to the Thessalonian church of First Thessalonians five seventeen. For a pray without ceasing. It's not that we're to be continually praying, but it, it is you pray uh, and uh, you know uh, you continue to pray. You continue to pray. Uh, it's something that should be a continual thing in our lives. And I want you to think of how essential it is for soldiers on the battlefield to be in contact with their commander-in-chief. And uh, even with their commanders on the battlefield. You've got to have that communication, don't you? Uh, I know it's vital. Why else do, do you think that one of the main things an enemy tries to do is jam the communications? They have ways of doing that, and that's what they try to do. They try to knock out the line of communications in any way that they can because they know that communication with the commanders is vital to successful battle. Now, prayer is just one of our sources of power for spiritual growth and perseverance in our lives. But it's a very important source, and it helps us to do what we talked about Last week, I mean last time, what what last week? I was on vacation last week, but the last time that we dealt with this, and when we're talking about uh, submitting to the will of God, prayer helps us to bend our will to God's will, which is what submitting uh, our lives to God is all about. And listen, although prayer cannot be reduced to a formula, we know that Jesus did teach his disciples to pray. And we can learn from that. We can learn from not just what he taught them, but we can learn from his prayers. We can learn from the prayers of godly men and women in Scripture. And even we can learn from the prayers of godly men and women today. Um, I, I love to hear someone pray a good, powerful prayer. Uh, you know, we, a lot of times when uh, we're in special meetings in different places, uh, You'll, you'll find someone who really knows how to get a hold of God, and it's a wonderful thing to see that. Um, what are some important aspects of prayer? Here's a message, okay? Some important aspects of prayer. Number one, prayer should include confession of our sin to God. That's first and foremost because obviously sin can block uh, our prayers. Uh, sin in all its manifestations can hinder our prayer life. Now, as we know that sin includes our iniquities. What's iniquities? Iniquity is a deviation from the way. We, we might think of it as that in Romans 3.23 of missing the mark. It's a de deviation from where you're trying to, time, trying to go. And Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. 
Psalm 59, verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, that he, uh, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. So iniquity, sin, uh, blocks uh, our prayers. Sin uh, uh, includes our disobedience whether that be by omission or commission. I know sins of omission are not doing what the Lord has told us to do. Sins of commission are doing what the Lord has told us not to do. And, uh, and we know that uh, uh, that's just simple disobedience is what it is. And that's how we got in this mess to begin with, was simple disobedience. Yeah. Nothing, you know, we wouldn't think of it as being as, anything egregious, but it's, it's egregious. Disobeying the Lord is egregious. Sin includes our, our selfish purposes. Uh, when I was talking about selfish purposes, I'm talking about living life to please ourselves rather than the Lord. It's, it's sad to see so many folks who profess to know the Lord that uh, have no heart or mind to live after God, to live for God don't really care to know the will of God for their life. They just, they've got their own thing going and they want to live life the way they, they want to live it. Uh, but, you know, you know, that's sin. Sin is, includes when we try to live our lives for our own selfish purposes. Sin includes our idolatries too. And make no mistake, uh, we have idolatries in 2021 in the United States. Idolatry is anything that we put before God in our life. And that can include friends, pleasures, habits, hobbies, sports, possessions, business, reputation, money, you name it. Anything that you put before God is an idol. Sin includes our unforgiveness. Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. What happens a lot of times, someone does us wrong and it just gets the best, better part of us. And I understand that because we're flesh. We can't control what the other person does. But listen, we can control, with the Holy Spirit's help, we can control our reaction to it. And the Lord wants us to control our reaction to the, uh, the things that come our way. But, you know, when somebody's got it in for us, when they're speaking evil of us, when they are um, uh, not treating us in a way that we feel like they should be treating us, we're to be kind one to another, remembering God's kindness for us. Sin also includes our unbelief. Unbelief. Not taking God at His word. That's what unbelief is. Um, Lord says it. Doesn't matter what He says. He says it, we, we're to believe it. <laughs> because of who He is. Now, listen to a couple of verses. One Old Testament, one New Testament. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And so confession of sin is necessary uh, to have prosperity in our Christian walk. First uh, John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I just want to remind you uh, as I do so often, um, that confession doesn't just mean saying I was wrong. It's saying the same thing about sin as what Jesus said about it, what God says about your sin. Saying the same thing. That's literally what the word confess means there in 1 John 1, 9. So say what God says about your sin. And it's possible for somebody to confess that they did somebody wrong, but they have no they don't have any qualms about it, they do it over again. That's not confession. Not biblical confession. Uh, just saying I did it. Uh, 
Confession is saying uh, the same thing that God says or agreeing with God, we should say. So prayer should include confession of our sin. Number two, prayer should flow out of our meditation on God and His Word. I'll say that again. Prayer should flow out of our meditation on God and His Word. Several things here. We should meditate on the attributes and person of God that leads to our worship and adoration of Him. When you think about God, the greatness of God, His attributes, Almighty God, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. And when you begin to think about Him, He's your God. That does something for you. <laughs> it, it'll, it'll cause you to, to worship and adore Him, which is what needs to be done. Now, that meditation, that, the meditation with regard to that is a focusing of our thoughts on God Himself. And it, primarily, that's the fir first, I should say, where our meditation ought to be is on God Himself. Uh, the psalmist said in one, Psalm 104, verse 34, he said, My meditation of Him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Then uh, we should meditate on the Word of God. <clears throat> now meditation in this uh, capacity is, is a thinking through or over, a reflecting on what the Lord has said. Meditation. Um, I've heard that the word meditate in, uh, in the Old Testament is the, the, the same idea of a cow out in the pasture. A uh, cow's got a couple of stomachs, and that cow... After it grazes, it goes back, throws it back up, chews on it a while. Meditate. And, and what we do is we graze through the Word of God, and we go back and we think about what the Lord has, has spoke to us through the Word of God. We know that Joshua 1.8 and Psalm 1.2 uh, uh, talk about how meditation on God's Word is linked to both prosperity and success. Um, another thing about this meditation, we should uh, uh, offer our thanksgiving to God. You know, when you think about think upon God, you meditate on God, you meditate on His Word. Um, you don't just get a big. He's not only magnified in your sight, but you become thankful unto Him. Um, when we meditate on the attributes of God, the person of God, and the Word of God, it should bring forth an attitude of gratitude, understanding God's great grace, and mercy, and provision in our life. Amen. God is so good to us. Uh, I'm trying to get more in the habit of when somebody says, you know, how are you? I'm blessed. You know, I might be having a bad day, but I'm still blessed. <laughs> you know? And I am. And you are. We all are. Um, Colossians 4 2 says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. I told you it was going to come back to that, right? We're, we're, we're to continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Philippians 4 6, again, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Um, Another thing is we should freely submit to the will of God. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because that was one of the disciplines all to itself. But uh, part of this comes from when you meditate upon uh, the attributes of God and the person of God and the Word of God, you come to understand that God's will is best. Right? <laughs> I mean, God knows it all. He just does. And His way is better than our way. It's tied very closely to Christ being our Lord, and not just our Savior. I mean, He, he has the right to call the shots. Um, I'm not going to turn over there with James 4, verse 7 through 10. We, like I said, the, in that last message, we dealt with that passage of Scripture there. But pride says, I'll do what I want to do, and I'll do it my way. Well, that goes contrary to God, doesn't it? Humility says, I'll do what the Lord wants, or I will look to the Lord 
who alone knows what is best. And the closer, listen, the closer that we draw nigh to God, I love the song that we sing, Draw Me Nearer, Nearer, Blessed Lord. Um, because that's what we need to do. The closer we draw nigh to God, the easier this becomes in our walk because when we draw nigh to Him, you know, we move His direction, He moves our direction. He draws nigh to us. Uh, so prayer should include confession of our sin to God. Prayer should flow out of our meditation on God and His Word. Number three, prayer should include our petitions or supplications. Those, those are the same, by the way. A petition, supplications are just where we ask God. Petition is a request. And listen, don't fall into the trap of some of these TV preachers that say, oh, you go to God and you demand. No, 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 no. You don't demand anything of God and you don't command God in any way. Excuse me. We, we, we do not command the sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords. So therefore, we must not demand anything from God. We ask. We request. The word translated petition means just that. It means to ask. A good example of this is found in 1 Samuel 1. Remember when Hannah asked for a child? Um, 1 Samuel 1, 17 says, Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And on later, in, in, in verse 20, it says, Wherefore it came to pass when the, the time was come, uh, about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. In fact, Samuel's name means asked of the Lord. That's what his name means. First Samuel 1 Samuel 1.27 She, when she took uh, Samuel back to the temple and gave him back to the Lord, she said, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. And she was there to, to give him back to the Lord. The Apostle John pointed out the importance of praying according to the will of God. Now, that's something that we need to get in the habit of, too. Um, I know we pray, uh, and, and I have no doubt in my mind because I've seen the Lord heal people, raise people up off of the sick bed. We pray for folks to heal, but if it be His will. Because it's not always His will to heal. It's, it's just not we need to pray according to the will of God. Now, let me let me just give you, this is not in my notes, but it just flashed across my brain. Sometimes it's dangerous, but uh, sometimes I forget what flashed too. But if we, if we pray for someone's healing and God's working in their life through what they have to bring them to some place in their life. Now, if God listened to us instead of going with what he knew was best, would it be better or worse for the person? It would be worse, wouldn't it? Yeah. So that's why we always qualify, Lord, if it be your will. If it be your will. And um, the Apostle John pointed out the importance of praying to, according to the will of God in 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us and if we know that He hear us, uh, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Listen, if you're praying according to His will, you're going to have your petitions. He's going to do His will. <laughs> we might be tempted to think, well, that's all well and good, Pastor, but what if we don't know what the will of God is? Well, can you say, Holy Spirit to the rescue? Look at Romans chapter number 6. Romans 6. <clears throat> Excuse me, Romans 8, I'm sorry. Typed it the wrong way in my scripture. I marked the right scripture, but I typed the wrong thing here. Romans 8, verse number 26. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, it says here, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not 
what we should pray for as we ought. Hey, you don't know what God's will is? Just jump on the bandwagon. We, we, we all struggle with that at times, don't we? We don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh its intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according, notice that, according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Holy Spirit to the rescue. Amen. Uh, Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 1.3, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We, we, we have all we need that pertains to life and godliness. What a blessing. And that comes, a lot of that comes through the Holy Spirit that indwells our heart and life. Um, turn to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. And we see what Jesus said here. Matthew 7. <clears throat> a lot of times people misinterpret some of these things. They, uh, they don't compare Scripture with Scripture and get the whole idea of what uh, this matter our prayer ought to be. Um, Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And then, don't stop there, okay? You have to read on here, but, or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, is bread a good thing? Yeah. Will he give him a stone? Yeah. God, God's not going to, you ask for something good, God's not going to give you something that's going to hurt you. Verse 10, if he, what if he asks for a fish? Will he give him a serpent? Uh, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? What's He going to give us? Good things. Don't bother asking for things that are not good. That's what I'm saying. You, you can read verse 7 and verse 8 and leave off the rest of that. You won't come away with that. You think, oh, I can just ask what I want to ask for. I can seek for what I want to seek for. I'll knock for what I want to knock for. And God, God's just going to give me anything and everything that I want. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what he's saying. So, so don't, uh, don't pull things out of context. Make sure that you are, are looking at things in the, as it relates to the whole of Scripture. Last thing here. <clears throat> Number four. Prayer should include our intercessions to God. An intercession is seeking the presence and hearing of God on behalf of others. When we intercede on someone's behalf. And we do that with our prayers. It is what we mainly do in, in our Wednesday night prayer time. It's what our prayer list is all about. Requests from other folks who've asked us to pray or someone has asked us to pray for those particular needs. Um... That's the purpose for why we pray Wednesday uh, and provide the prayer list like we do. Some examples of this type of praying are, uh, remember as the children of Israel were going through the, um, uh, the wilderness and uh, they would get in trouble with God and God's about ready to wipe them out, start all over. What did Moses do? He interceded on their behalf. Yeah. Um, what about the prayers of Job for his friends in Job 42, verse 7 through 10? In fact, flip over there. I, didn't, I wasn't intending on, on going over here, but uh, I, you, you got to see this. Uh, you got to see this. Job, Job uh, 42, the very last chapter of Job. Job, Job 42, and we, we know from reading the book of Job, pain that his friends were, right? Well, God was upset with him. And it, it, 
it tells us as much. And look at uh, Job 42, verse number 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. Boy, they weren't in a very good position, were they? <laughs> For ye have not spoken of me the right thing, that the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullets and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. The Lord was saying, I'm not going to listen to you guys. You need to get Job to pray for you. You need to get Job to inter intercede on your behalf. For him, he says, will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that which ye have not spoken of me, the thing which is right, like my servant Job. Um, you know there's people that need us to pray for them because God's not going to listen to them. They're not in a position to be heard by God. And a lot of them don't know that they're there. You ever, ever have somebody who's deep in sin tell you about all the, all the praying they do? Open the windows, turn on the fans, see if it can get out, get out of it, and, and go, go up. No, it won't. <laughs> prayers of, think about the prayers in the New Testament, the prayers of the church for Peter when he was imprisoned by Herod in Acts 12 5. Remember that? Peter's locked up. He's got a death sentence on him. I mean, Herod's going to have, have him killed the next day. All of a sudden, the angels are unlocking the prisons, but it was according to the prayers of God's people. They were praying. <laughs> praying so hard, in fact, when he's knocking on the door, you know, they, uh, they didn't like their prayer meeting being interrupted. <laughs> uh, had a hard time believing that it was Peter. And there they were praying for him, and he's at, at the door knocking. What about the prayers of Paul that he mentions in his epistles to the church? This is a very interesting study in itself. And I'm just going to give you the references. We're not going to turn there. Ephesians 1, verse 15 and following. Philippians 1, verse 3 and following. And Colossians 9, verse 1 and following. He talks about how he prayed for each of these churches. The prayers that he was praying for them. I want you to know that had to be an encouragement to those churches. Uh, the Apostle Paul would take time to pray for them. Listen, continual prayer is God's will for us. We must always have an attitude of prayer wherever we are and whatever we're doing. I heard or read one time many years ago of the late Dr. John R. Rice that people would come up to him uh, where he would be speaking at and they would uh, give him a prayer request to say, Dr. Rice, I'd love for you to pray for my... And they would give him a request. And you know what he would do? He would break out into prayer right then and there. That's what you call instant in prayer. He's instant in prayer. You must have an attitude of prayer wherever we are and whatever we're doing. Having an attitude of prayer, listen... Having an attitude of prayer will go a long way toward, number one, keeping us from sin and helping us to guard our testimony. Number two, keeping us from worry and fear. These days that we live right now, you hear a lot of worry and fear from professing believers. Um... We're not to worry. We're not to fear. Uh, having attitude of prayer will go a long way toward keeping us from self-sufficiency. I mean, if you're praying and you're depending upon the Lord, that keeps you from being self-sufficient, right? Yep. Um, number four, keeping us from having an unforgiving spirit. You can't be in connection with God and hang on to a spirit against someone else you got to let it go. 
I mean, when you understand what He's done for you and the great, the great sin that He has uh, uh, forgiven you of, you just you say, well, you know, I'm just going to leave it in the Lord's hands. I'm going to be what I should be. I'm going to do what I should do. They're going to have to deal with it with God. But they're not going to have to deal with me over it. Okay. Keep us from having an unforgiving spirit. And number five, keeping us focused on the right things. Um, like souls of men and the eternal things rather than the temporal things. Amen. Well, I hope it's been a help to you tonight. Discipline of prayer. Didn't tell you really much of anything that you didn't already know, but we need reminders, right? We need reminders from time to time. That's that's my job. Just remind you what the Word of God says, and uh, the Lord has to remind me to be able to remind you. So let's uh, be careful about the disciplines. Discipline of first of all, do you have the gospel in your life? Are you saved? Number two, submission to God. Wanting God's will for your life. Surrendering to His Lordship for your life. Number three, prayer. Um, the discipline of prayer. Highly important. We'll take a look at another discipline, Lord willing, next week. Let's pray.